Hi guys. So we are very hyped up because we have Mike Jones from Primal Canine joining us today to talk all about protection. So Mike has been working with dogs for decades and he actually started working with dogs when he was 13 years old. So it's a very unique per, uh, perspective. So let's add Mike in. Shout out to Aaron for approving it before Mike even knew about it. Here we go. Hey, uh, we're back. <laughs> we're back. We're live. I can hear you. <laughs> nice. Yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's tough up here uh, in, in the woods. You know, <laughs> it's a little, little uh, the, the connection gets a little messed up. Well, I have uh, woods envy. We don't have all that space down here in L.A. <laughs> so. so I wanted to, before we jump into the protection stuff, I wanted to talk about you and how you got started because you've been doing this for a long time, really made a name for yourself. How'd you get started? So, I mean, first, thank you for having me on. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, honestly, I, I started training dogs out of, one, I was a... I was, I was really young. I was 13 years old, um, but I got I started getting by getting in trouble. Uh, and the reason why I was working with dogs is just because I was just out and about trying to avoid my household situation. Uh, and I was just out with dogs, and like I just wanted to make friends with all the stray dogs that were either chasing us on bikes, skateboards, whatever it was. Uh, and I just was like I was really intrigued with like how to communicate with them. So that was my main thing is I just wanted to be around like, you know, that, the, like, you know, dogs. And, you know, I say this in a lot of interviews that I've done before was just, you know, you know, dogs help me humanize uh, because I just was just so out, out there and doing what I was doing that I didn't, you know, it, it, it was hard to be human until the dogs actually helped me start learning communication. So I started doing that, but that's, that's how my whole, life started <laughs> started with a dog training um doing uh rescue and adoption stuff until the behavioral cases <clears throat> i mean the, i remember the first dog i worked with was a dog who was extremely koa um was extremely aggressive uh and i and when i not say aggressive i mean like that because right, there's different terms between aggressive and reactive this dog was like naturally aggressive uh and that was one of the dogs i worked with and it it literally i mean one of the dogs that actually kind of like helped save like my life when i was a younger dog or younger younger dog younger person so i mean that was one of the ones that uh that helped me a lot mm. yeah I, I started in ad adoption uh, shelter work in community service so <laughs> that's how, that's how i started mm -hmm. and i know you said that protection is only a small part of primal canine that, yep so um I, I love that you've been working with dogs for so long. I think that's really cool. Uh, and it makes sense why you don't just, uh, I, I saw on your website how you're, you don't, you just have a different approach to each dog. And a lot of the, the dogs that come to you have different behavioral issues. Um, so that being said, when it comes to like selecting a uh, protection dogs, are there certain characteristics about a dog? Like can yeah. any dog be a protection dog? So I've said that I mean, genetics matter. And then especially when it comes to protection dogs, genetics a hundred percent matter. Uh, training matters as well. Not every single dog can be a protection dog. Uh, you know, they can't, all not all dogs can be protection dogs, and like the the fact that like a lot of people think that you know oh my dog's naturally going to protect me and all this other stuff um that's like the thought process of like you stepping into a ring you know with someone who's a trained fighter yeah you know, like you're like i mean can you naturally have some skills and strength and technique possibly is it going to save you in a real life scenario Probably not. I mean, but if it's trained and you've trained this consistently and you work this consistently, uh, then yeah, then the, the, uh, of course the dog can. I mean, there's a dog I trained a few years back that, I mean, like one, you know, especially with social media, 
that uh, everyone went crazy about was a dog named Dozer. It was a dog that uh, one of our friends, uh, Francis, rescued from Rocket Dog, and like it was a little pity. Uh, and that dog naturally had the gift. Like, I mean, I, when I say naturally had the gift, had the natural gift of, you know, could could do protection work. But not all dogs can do protection work. It, it, it is something that genetics have to be there. Training has to be there. You can try and do your best, but it, it's going to be a, you, you have to have one dedicated trainer and you have to have those genetics there. Mm -hmm. So with Rika, if I were to bring Rika over and say, hey, could Rika do protection? What would you say to me? I would, I would, I would, we would just work. That's all we would do. We would just work. I mean, we would just see what we can do. We would maximize whatever she could possibly do. Like my style of training uh, is very much adapted to the dog that's in front of me. Like I, I just work with the dog that's in front of me and the person that's in front of me. I don't. I don't have necessarily like, oh, like you have to have this in order to do it. Um, if you brought Rika up and then we would work, that, that would be it. Like we're just like, all right, let's see what we can do. We can maximize the potential completely. Mm -hmm. So one uh, concern, hesitation I have about um, training Rika in protection is like um, – controlling her you know I, I know that a lot of my my mood can kind of be projected onto Rika and like if I you know like I, I have to be really mindful of that I would um be nervous about like making Rika like a liability like say she bites the wrong person or yeah. well it's all a goal it's all a game in the beginning at least mm -hmm. like the way that I train it it's a game it's like elevated le a, le a level of plain tug Mm -hmm. it's not real until I know that the dog can actually mentally handle it. And then we turn it real. We start using hidden equipment, muzzle work, things of that nature. But in the beginning, it's just, it's, it's, it's just a game uh, because you have to learn how to switch drives. You know, it's a, a drive manipulation is a huge thing. And this is when a lot of people will create, you know, create issues because they, they start forcing more defense. Like they want to go, right into the dog, bah, 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 like all this other stuff. And what happens when you create that level of defense, you create fear biting. And when you create fear biting, you create liability. But if you create a game and, and prey and then use drive manipulation, then you don't have fear biting. You just have a dog who likes to play tug and do all this other stuff. This is how like a lot of like, you know, protection dog trainers, everyone's like, you know, talks crap about it, like, you know, prey monsters and all this other stuff. But like, I mean, if you're just doing it for fun and you're doing it as a sport, I mean, that's all sport is. You know, it's it's prey driving the central. I mean, that that's a a suit is a, basically a giant tug. Right. So I mean, like you know, if if you play it in that way, then you play it in that way. If you switch and you manipulate drives, then you know, then then you know how to actually create a dog versus create a protection dog versus just like a dog who's in a bite on the sleeve or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, so also, um, I know a lot of people say, like, get your dog involved with sports as soon as, like, as early as possible. Um, we have not gone, gone into sports. And honestly, I, I did not. I, I know that you say pick a sport before getting the dog. We didn't do that. Uh, it's, how do we get into a sport now or how bad is it? I mean, will she be good at it? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's one of those things like, you know, uh, so again, uh, you know, with the, with training in general uh, and just kind of watching the, like your page uh, in the last, just so everyone knows the reason why I'm so groggy is because literally I just woke up from a freaking like passed out for a second because <laughs> I'm so goddamn tired uh, before this thing. Um, but you don't have to be involved in the sport. You don't have to be involved in any sports. You don't have to do anything like that. Um, you just have to kind of find what you want, like what you like, what style of things that you want to do. Um, we started actually with Oscar Mora, who you've uh, talked to before. We started uh, Canine Street League, and that's launching in February uh, the 6th. That's the first actual uh, Street League uh, decoy seminar. 
but it's based for entry level stuff all the way to advanced level stuff. You don't have to do all the meticulous things that most you know people want with like the focus till and everything like that, or you don't have to be based on legs or upper body or a sleeve or anything like that. It's just stuff that's like good for dogs and for handlers. Um, and it's also a professional sport. So like you actually get paid for winning, you know, and doing those things like that too. Um, but like, let's say if you wanted to get involved in the sport in general, I mean, you being, you're, you're down South, right? Mm -hmm, in LA. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you kind of have like limitless uh, trainers and people around you. Um, and I mean, there's PSA, there's ring, there's so many different, uh, different options out there, but with a uh, street league, street league's, uh, first thing's going to be in LA. Uh, and that'll be, a uh, that'll be out there in LA. Awesome. I'll have to check it out. We are moving, but I mean, we'll be back in LA. So we'll are you back? Are you, are you still living down South? Uh, yeah, right now in LA, but we're going to, um, move to New York for a little bit. And, uh, get out of the city for a while but as that aside <laughs> um bringing up a uh, street league i feel like a lot of people are intimidated to join a club or get involved with protection because it is a little bit intimidating uh, wh why do you think it's so intimidating and um i mean why well, dog people are assholes <laughs> i mean like just to be <laughs> just just to be blatantly honest, you know, dog people are, you know, they're assholes. I mean, you know, it, I, I started, uh, let's say like, you, like we talked in the beginning, like I started when I was 13 doing rescue and doing all the stuff that I did. I hopped into a club uh, right after I got out of prison and I walked in the German Shepherd Club in San Jose. Uh, and, you know, those people are, you know, people are very meticulous. Dog people are extremely meticulous. I mean, if you could if you look at the higher levels of dog people and like the way that they act and the way that they talk, everyone is basically extremely OCD and they're very particular, you know, it's like, they're very particular on how this dog does this. Blah, blah, blah. So it's like, you know, high levels of OCD and there's people are very, like a lot of people are always like, you know, it's, everyone's like, Oh, they're OCD or whatever like that. And like, you know, like what I say, I was like, no, they're just, they're very meticulous as far as what they think is right and what they think they should be doing. So, they develop an attitude. Uh, and I think that's the biggest thing that happens with um, new dog trainers. Cause I mean, I do Q and A's all the time. Uh, new dog trainers, they go into clubs. They're like, well, they just get thrown back a little bit. They're like, well, what, what? Like, 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 you know, these are, this is intimidating because these people make that, it make it that intimidating. And that's another reason why, you know, we've, de we've developed the culture that we've developed just to make sure that we can, make it more accommodable. Um, but there are a lot of clubs throughout the United States. Um, you know, you going to the East Coast, uh, moving over there. I mean, there is a lot of great clubs out there and a lot of good people out there who are do like they're doing great work and they're also very accommodable and they're very, they're very nice people who want to work. Um, I think California has its own little issue when it comes to clubs as well. Uh, I don't think that it's a uh, I don't think it's a, a nationwide thing. I think it's just kind of a California thing <laughs> at that point. I mean, I mean, I've done seminars in New York, uh, New Jersey, everything out there, and I've, uh, I'm pretty positive it's a California thing. Um, <laughs> the East Coast is intimidating as well, but I mean, everyone's really accommodating. So, mm -hmm. it I, yeah, follows to the play, follows to the the sport and what they do. Mm -hmm. Um. I definitely, so I went out, Rick and I went to Chino uh, to v visit Oscar and uh, I think it's um, Origin Ring Sports, Darshan, that um, facility over there. And when we went there, I was very intimidating, but it was also very humbling. Like, I think it's really good for people to go into that environment and kind of uh, get a reality check of like, you don't know anything, <laughs> you know, like, because I think that's something, um, that's something that I think is good for people to kind of be um, knocked down and realize like, okay, you're, you're a beginner in this space. Yeah, and you know, the, the good thing too, I mean, like positives with that is that there's so many different like, you can be so high level in one sport or one thing and then go to another sport and absolutely know nothing. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's like, you know, what I, you know, what I love in general with dog training is the fact that like, you know, I, I started in behavior mod and I went into protection and then, you know, we started at PCU and I started working with, um, you know, Andy Kruger, who is a French ring decoy <clears throat> and it's super, he's a super select decoy. And I was like showing him some leg work. He's like, Mike, that's absolutely horrible. Like, <laughs> like the leg. <laughs> and like for me, like, you know, obviously like, I've worked with like, you know, different age that we've done a bunch of stuff. Like, you know, like obviously like I can be like, you know, as egotistical as I need, I want to be with it. But like, I was just like, for me, like that was like, I told Andy, he's like, Andy's like, oh, dude, he's like, I hope you like take that offense for that. I was like, I was like, absolutely not. Like that just makes yeah. things better, you know, mm -hmm. like. I mean, like, because like you said, it is humbling in a sense when you when you go into sports, especially with the particulars. And if you're looking at like ring stuff where it's based on the handler as well, not just the dog or like PSA, like, you know, just different things. Like it's always it's always really cool to see the the variances. And like that's the big thing when it comes to uh, dog training is that, you know, or, you know, sport protection training is that there's so many different variances and different levels and different like understanding of it. Like you can be great in one sport, but you can be horrible in another, or you can be great at dog training, but be horrible in dog protection sports. I mean, like there's, just, and, and in the, you know, even the obedience levels, I mean, there's so many different things that can play a part. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think clubs in general are just, you know, if you go to a dog training club or a sport club, you know, it's important to know what you're getting into when you, when you're working with that. Mm -hmm. And connect with good people. I know yeah. Oscar and Tarshan, they were very welcoming. And, well, Oscar's, and Oscar's, a, Oscar's my, my dude, and he's part of, a, he's, one of the, he's one of the heads of Street League, so you'll be seeing me down south here pretty soon. Awesome. Love it. Um, okay. I want to get to some of these questions. Oh, okay. Before we dive into the questions that people submitted, um, Ivy. So Ivy is oh, how old is Ivy? Ivy is six years old. Okay. So the big, uh, the, the big thing: are protection dogs good with family? Are they good with children? What are your thoughts? You just cut out. Can't hear you. We're having technical issues. Hello. But it's funny that you actually asked me about that because uh, uh, Ivy just tried to FaceTime me. <laughs> <laughs> Speak of the devil. <laughs> yep. um, how is Ivy with kids? I mean, how are protection dogs with kids and with, what is Ivy's experience with these types of dogs? Uh, I'm extremely you know, cautious. You know, I, I know what these dogs are capable of, um, especially the ones that we raise and the style that we raise them. I know what they're capable of. I know which dogs to put around my daughter and I know which not, ones not to. I mean, my kid is my everything. So I don't like, I don't chance, I, you know, that's why she's tattooed on my face. I, <laughs> I don't chance a, a goddamn mm -hmm. thing when it comes to my, my baby. Um, so with her, you know, it's always, it's just basically like making sure I have the right partnership. Uh, when she was one years old, I got Cerberus. Uh, and what Cerberus like comes raised around her. Uh, she learned how to, you know, be around the dog. And she was just, you know, Ivy's first words were, foo or one of her first words was fooey. So, <laughs> and, and that was what, and that was, like, you know, besides, you know, Baba, which is daddy and Farsi, because uh, my, my daughter's Persian. Um, they, you know, she was like, you know, it was Baba, and then it was Mama, and then it was like Fooey, and she was like telling the dogs like, and then it was like, you know, that dog, bad dog, like you know, Fooey, like she was just saying this stuff all the time. So I made sure that the dog or the dog understood that she was a person, not just a plaything, and she and it was just maybe a smaller person. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but you know, with her, it was just mostly about understanding boundaries. And there's dogs that I do have that I would never put around my daughter like 100% and dogs that we've raised, I would never put around my kid, like, at all. Um, but, you know, if you 
bring them up, you work them with, you work with them, you start doing the things that you got to do with them, and you start, to, you know, you have the right genetics and everything like that. Then, yeah, then you can one hundred percent put your dog around uh, your your child. But it, it it definitely does need to be done in a like a specific way, mm-hmm. in my opinion, at least. You know, and it, you know, my way is different than other people's ways, and I don't fault anyone else. But the way that I do things, you know, I you know, I'm a helicopter dad, so I, I, I'm I, I'm always on it <laughs> with with that stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, with that, the whole biting, um, I had um, posted about how I um, how we, we train, trained Rika not to bite and be gentle with us. And I've gotten a lot of shit um, from people saying that um, I'm, I'm killing Rika's drive, um, like killing that bite. Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So that's like the way that I was brought up with was like compulsion. Like if you use compulsion, then like you're killing drive and all this other stuff. Um, I know tons of, I mean, I know tons of people who do it differently and they have complete success in what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, they're you know, stopping by inhibition, all this other stuff. And it's only situational as far as like what the dog, you know, what sport they're you know, participating or whatever. We have a lot of clients that, you know, we do the same thing with where it's like, all right, cool. We're going to, you know, they they live a certain life and I have to make sure that we use a lot of compulsion or at least impulse control to make sure the dog doesn't bite them consistently. Uh, I mean, it, unless you're stopping them from biting a tug, a wedge, a, a sleeve, a suit, things of that nature in that circumstance, because, you know, again, dogs being extremely a, associative based and uh, associate uh, associating a specific exercise with what they're doing um and depending on the age as well and just the dog's nerves in general it's not going to be a big issue uh it's just a lot of preference for people Mm -hmm. so it's basically like um giving them that outlet to bite and like okay you bite the tug or bite the sleeve bite the suit but yeah it's just based on it's like don't bite you but you can bite this thing you know you can like play with this we, this is the time that you do it you give them that outlet it's like going to the gym or something of that sort mm-hmm. okay let me see your question um okay this is from brody the english lab okay so yes genetics have to be there but what if you don't know oh what if you don't know the background of a dog like their genetics someone just asked you just play, I mean, so the I mean, the way I got started, uh, I didn't get started with any dogs that had any genetic background whatsoever. Like, literally no genetic background. Like, up until six, seven years ago, when I started actually researching genetics, I just worked the dog to the best level they can possibly have. But what I looked for was a specific amount of prey drive, and then I went from there. And then I built them up through, you know, chasing a rag to chasing a tug to chasing a pillow to um, getting a sleeve onto a suit if they can, even if they got to that level. Um, but I just worked with the dog that was in front of me. I mean, genetics do 100% play a part, uh, but I mean, it's not all the parts. My, you know, my mentor, uh, Terry, would you say is like the best dog is a, a dog in the backyard of somewhere else. <laughs> someone's house or a farm somewhere is like it's not the dog that's been bred for it and in terry is a worldwide national competitor uh, competitor in schutzen when it was actually called schutzen so mm-hmm. he was like the best dog is you know not necessarily genetically built but it's a dog that you know is is in a yard somewhere that people don't know what they have mm-hmm. so just work with the dog that's in front of you you know that's what i would say mm-hmm. Um, speaking of breeds of dogs, this is a question from Bastion Bain. Should KNPV lines that have possessive traits be raised differently to avoid resource, resource guarding issues, but to not kill for kill drive for protection? So this is actually, that's, that's a great question. So for everybody who is probably on here and has Malinois or Dutch Shepherds, uh, it's very important to understand that Mountain Walls and Dutch Shepherds are no longer just one specific breed. Like, they're not Mountain Walls and Dutch Shepherds. They are definitely bred 
it's for specific lines, uh, specific purposes, routines. If you look at, you know, like any ring routine, you know, you got 40 minutes of a routine, you know, and those dogs are typically smaller, a little bit more lean. Uh, you know, they're built for that actual routine. Uh, KMPV dogs are bred for much larger, you know, they're much larger, they're bigger. Uh, their routines aren't that long. You know, they're, they're built for impact and all this other stuff. Uh, you know, dominance and possession are different things. They, they, they build longer, they mature. I always kind of accredit uh, them to being like the mastiff of, of the Malinois, <clears throat> just because we've done so many different things or the Dutchies <clears throat> or whatever they come from. I mean, should I have a whole freaking <laughs> space full of them right now? And I, I, I know what these guys and they develop differently. Um, so, it, it, you know, a Malinois is not a Malinois, a Dutch is not a Dutch, uh, you know, and especially depending on what exactly we're bred, they're bred for, you know, that's a different thing. Uh, the diminishing a, their possessiveness, it's a, their possessiveness is a genetic quality. Look at the box revere, look at the, you know, all the other stuff that they got to do. It is a genetic quality if it's bred properly. Uh, diminishing that, depending on what the need is, is independent on, on based on what you're looking for. Uh, I personally don't start using compulsion or anything on my dogs until six to eight months, depending on how crazy my dog is. Um, but I won't, I, de I, I, I do not necessarily um, condone like their possessiveness just because of my household. Um, but if it's dependent on the sport, then I, I let that slide a little bit. Mm -hmm. For anyone that doesn't know what compulsion is, can you explain that? So compulsion, um, a lot of that's correction. I mean, it just it's a fancy word for that, for like at least to me. Um, it's based on, you know, correcting the dog from doing something, just stopping them from doing it. It's like that's for me, like that's correction. Um, and it's stopping it, you know, impulse control. Uh, if you're looking at, if you're talking about impulse control, is that if you put it, if you throw a ball and the dog wants to go for it and you have to correct the dog and you're using compulsion, again, there's the word. <laughs> if you use compulsion to correct the dog into the spot that you need to be in and, you know, you're using, utilizing both of them. For me, if like, let's say there's a copper pipe or a box or anything like that and I get a, you know, a pH one dog here uh, or anything like that, like, I'm going to have to stop from doing what they want to do. Um, so that's using compulsion, which is correction and uh, impulse control. So um, good dog boy training asked, um, what are your thoughts on uh, using a bite sleeve yourself with your dog? Unless you, unless you understand dry manipulation and understand that, you know, what you're putting yourself into I don't advise uh, working your own dog whatsoever. Um, you can, you can, and I only reason why I say this is I've done this myself. Uh, Cerberus has bitten me. Uh, it just because I started his foundation, I had no one else uh, to work my dog. Uh, and I, after that, and you know, talking to my mentors, because that when I was like 22 or something like that, uh, my mentor was like, he was like, he's like, never work your own dog, do all this other stuff. And then once I got my first Malinois and I worked like my pities and everything like that, everyone was just like, dude, it's like, you know, like you got to work the dog and all this other stuff like that. So I started working my own dog and I work Cerberus and I tend to have more of a square frame. And what I mean by that is that even though if I promote like myself as like, a per like using more prey uh, and do all that stuff, I square up a lot, which creates more of a defensive picture for my dog and Cerberus and myself got into it <laughs> uh, once. And after that, I've, I've never worked any of my dogs. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would never, I always advise people unless you absolutely, like now I know how to do my foundation on my dogs and I do my foundation on my dogs and I transfer it over. Um, yeah. But I would never work my dogs to do, I would never work my dogs completely 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. but, but someone also asked, um, can you, train your dog in protection um, doing online courses? No. Okay. Yeah, 100% um, no. Okay. Um, also, how does insurance work for protection dogs? Or 
do you recommend insurance? Uh, personal liability insurance is definitely what you need, um, depending on where you are. I didn't hear you. I just cut out. In insurance. Oh, so with insurance, uh, so personal liability insurance is what you need. You know, where you are, consult with a lawyer. But in California, as long as you have personal liability insurance, I think it's like up to like freaking like a million or something like that, working with that. But I mean, you're fine. Uh, we we practice here specifically a two warning um, law or like what I teach all my like my clients and my uh, people we train with is that they get two warnings, a back up. Hey, back up, and then dog gets sent, or my dog will bite, and then sent. So technically, it's two and a half warnings, um, and then we go from there. And then I always make sure that my clients that tell I tell them like, make sure you have cameras, all this other stuff to make sure you protect yourself. But it, I mean, in California, you can get friggin' sued for fucking anything, really. I mean, right. it's it's ridiculous. Um, but I always, you know, personal liability is the biggest thing, and the messed up part is that it's different throughout every state. Mm -hmm. in, is every it, state um, in with United California, States. it's any bite is your fault. Um, yeah, because dogs are property. Uh -huh. So if your property or gets your property messes up another person's thing, then mm -hmm. you know you have all that stuff. So Cali is its own little so, weird thing. Um. Uh, uh, Dana with the dogs is asking, how did you recover after the altercation with Cerberus? Um, so my altercation with Cerberus, like I, for me, I know like any mistakes my dogs make are my mistake. So I always 100% know that like I, no matter what my dogs do, I know it's my fault. Um, and this is something I learned a long time ago. So I just kind of calculated back thought about okay like what did I do wrong how did I do this um, and then I just proceeded forward uh, and I just was like okay cool like he just used to me being the guy that he bites mm -hmm. so I'm gonna stop that and I started working on him you know just being more neutral around that I didn't I, I honestly I don't think Cerberus did a bite for like four or five weeks after that and I just when I worked with him I just worked with him like with a decoy and a tie back like where I wasn't even necessarily involved. I just put him on the tie back and went from there. But I've, I have better um, better ways of doing things now when it comes to that. Um, but, you know, with it, uh, with Cerberus, that was a uh, – Cerberus being the crazy little turd he is, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 we, we got intense for a second. But, but now he's, you know, he's, he's always – he's my main guy when it comes to – teaching like scenarios and everything like mm -hmm. that just because how, how um, clear someone's it is asking um can i uh zelda the rot can i expect a rottweiler to have the same amount of agility and enthusiasm to work as a malinois i don't think you can expect i mean the longevity or the the and this is again always perspective and like whatever's going on i mean there's like a was a django in uh in holland uh who is a crazy cane pv rottweiler who is smaller uh does does all this other stuff uh, my buddy in tennessee who breeds smaller like french line rotties uh and again for people who don't really understand like you know dog breeding there's different lines within different breeds and once you get into america uh you know, Americans like to manipulate breed lines and all genetics and everything like that. Uh, so we <laughs> we tend to manipulate them. Uh, typically, if you're looking at the most what proto prototypical like rot rot rotty, the dog shouldn't be able to do what they do. But we just did a board and train six, eight months ago with a dog named uh, Samson, um, who's actually in L.A. Uh, and that dog has he's a big boy. He's 90 to 100 pounds lean uh he can't work on a bite as long as the dog like aaron's dog ozzy but for a roddy he can work well um he just had really bad placement and everything that he was you know uh worked on like his targeting was horrible and his grips were bad but we fixed all those things and he also does he can he can do dual purpose stuff like the dog you know he hunts for weed like crazy um he can do odor like nuts does 
passive indications now. I mean, there's just so many different things that the, the dogs can do, but it's always independent, you know, and like, this is where a lot of people were always like, they ask about like, you know, breed specific, can a Roddy do this? Can Adobe do this? Can a Mel do this? It's independent on what you're, what you have, and, you know, what type of dog that you have. I mean, there's dogs that, you know, we call unicorns that can do everything, uh, no matter what their breeds or genetics are or anything like that. It just kind of depends on what you got. And if you look at a breed specifically, and if you're looking for a specific purpose, it's important to look at like, okay, like what is this breeder, the person who bred the dog, uh, breeding that dog specifically for? So, I mean, Roddy's in general, I mean, if you look at Samson, which is the working Roddy, um, before he got to us, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't much, but after that, I mean, like the dog's, the dog's a monster. I mean, the dog can do, I mean, we work two hour um, sessions. With with obedience, mm -hmm. odor, and protection. For people that do um, protection work, how often should they train and how long? Uh, it's independent on the dog, um, personally to me. Uh, it's always independent on the dog. It's based on what they do. Like, um, me and my, our, our, another friend of ours, Nino Dewar, SDS, you know, can I like, he's like, if you can work every single day with your dog and work every your dog every single day, but that's because he, he likes a lot of genetically superior dogs, uh, and dogs who can do that every single day. Uh, I do that with my dogs. I, I try to be when I'm not injured because currently I'm broken uh, with my left shoulder and left knee. Um, but typically, we, we work our dogs as much as we can. I mean, you got to do as much work as possible, but understand that when you do it, when you work your dog every single day, all we're doing is we're building up a ton of drive and we're building the expectation that the dog, the dog thinks, oh, I'm working today. So you build a lot of frustration within that dog. So work them as much as you possibly can always put them up hot but understand the expectation okay. is there Obi -Wan. he's asking are there any mondio or french ring clubs in or close to las vegas okay i have no clue <laughs> um oh <laughs> another question so um if your dog is pulling or thrashing and you want to you want to get them to bite full uh how do you train that So this is, well, this is a multiple, a multiple answers to this. Um, if your dog is pulling and thrashing on a suit, you don't want to do that. Scale them back, put them on a sleeve, um, or even then put them on like a little wedge. Make sure that you're rewarding specifically the digs, encounters. You have to have a decoy who understands this um, because if you don't have a decoy who understands this, uh, they're just going to consistently reward negative behavior. And what I, what I mean by that is dogs learn everything by, like I said, you know, associative based behavior. So they learn everything by markers. So if you're holding up a tug and the dog is pulling the tug consistently and you're making a bunch of noise and the dog is pulling, 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 they don't understand it when you, you know, they dig in and you don't, you don't reward them for anything. Right. So for us, like what I do is that, from trying to train counters and all this other stuff with dogs who don't naturally do it is that, you know, I'll hold the tug up uh, or the sleeve up and have the sleeve on. And then once the dog counters, I make a noise. And usually if you've seen our videos, it's like moving on. Oh, or anything like that. And then once I say those noise, the handler makes their, you know, their marker, good job, good boy, good girl, whatever it is. And they understand, the dog understands, oh, hey, like, that's what I was supposed to do. And I slip the sleeve or give him the tongue or do whatever. But, I mean, a lot of it, you know, a lot of times what happens is people want to put dogs in a suit real quick uh, just to please the helper or just to please, like, you know, you know the helper or the client or whatever it may, may be. And then you get a lot of sloppy work from there. But it, it is, it's a process, you know. The grips, you know, it's just like learning how to punch right and, you know, do all the other stuff. You know, you've got to learn the proper technique, the proper foundation, the way to do things. I was and, going to you know, ask go you, um, before I ask that, when do you graduate to, to the um, bite sleeve? Oh, you say go. Okay. Yeah, it's... it's
Yeah, yeah. Can you... um, I was going to ask you, when do you kind of like graduate to the bite sleeve? Uh, it's independent on the dog. I mean, once I got, for me, um, if it's a dog that Aaron and I have in our household, and I know the dog's grips are solid and, you know, they're good, I'll put them onto the sleeve or the suit. Uh, or if I'm going to go to the sleeve, I'll probably put them onto the suit pretty quickly. I know there's other people who do it differently, um, but it's always independent on the dog that's in front of me uh, and just what the progression where it is. I mean, like, there's dogs I've gotten in from, we've imported, and, you know, we put them onto the, uh, like, a, a suit or a sleeve, and I'm like, oh, like, your grips are solid right into the suit. There's dogs that we come in, like, okay, like, go through literally incremental steps where it's like tug, wedge, you know, pill, or pillow, wedge, suit, or sleeve, suit, and then go back to, you know, uh, wedge, and then go from um, there. And I just want to say, you, you, the person is doing that with a trainer at a club, doing it. Can you just hammer that home? Why is that so important? You got it. Protection work should never be done by yourself. Don't look at YouTube. Don't look at anything like that. You're working with a trainer. Don't even look at a club. Get a trainer that actually specifies this and specializes in this and does this full time. Protection and your dog will not naturally protect you. This is another thing I need to make sure that everyone understands. Your dog, no matter what you get it, oh, my dog will always do this. Your dog will not naturally protect you if not trained. And, you know, just like I said before, if you're like, let's say like you're naturally athletic and then you want to step in a ring with a professional mixed martial arts fighter or a boxer or a kickboxer and you go into that ring, you're probably going to get your ass whooped. That's the same thing with your dog. Your dogs are not don't under, understand if they don't see the pictures. And this is why it's important to have a professional mm -hmm. trainer. How, uh, from Bucket Headed, how do you use random reinforcement when training sport or protection dogs? Random reinforcement. I'm not too sure uh, what random okay. reinforcement is. I don't either. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, My brother's Malinois always be re <laughs> resource guarding him. Anyone gets near him, he throws a fit. I mean, these a lot of these questions are um, going off of the um, protection topic. Do you care to go into the general stuff? It's it's five four. Yeah, it's five forty. Yeah, um, are you good? Okay, perfect. So oh, I'm great. Okay, how do you teach a dog to walk? Because my German Shepherd just act like crawling. <laughs> So a lot of my answers are going to be go seek a trainer, depending on where you're at. Um, I, I, I won't, I mean, I try and I do a lot of Q and A's as you probably know. Uh, but I'm always just, it's very much find a trainer, especially when it comes to correction. Cause I don't know the dog. I don't know who's in front of them. Uh, and you know, dogs are, you know, reply differently to depending on like what the correction collar that we're using, but find a, find a trainer, find a correction that works best for your dog. Also, find engagement. Find a way to engage with your dog in a proper way so your dog doesn't think that everyone else is cool and everyone, every dog is cool and you're the coolest person in the room. So always consistently work with that. You know, that's why all my dogs, you know, for the most part, work for their meals. Okay, Bucket I'm Headed asked, what's the difference between IPO and PSA? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Uh oh, I'll, I'll laugh because like I, I feel okay. like that well, would then be a go, go to Google. We'll skip it. <laughs> but, All these easy questions. We only have Mike for a limited time. Let's be specific. Ask good questions. Yeah. Sleeve and suits. Different exercises. Tons um, of different things. Okay, I'm just going through these. There he is. With my brother yeah. KD on here. I just saw this guy here. <laughs> Yeah, that's my, uh, that's my man. By right the way, there. sorry, KD, you lost the poll. <laughs> Mike and his beard <laughs> won <Yeah>. by a landslide. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, what qualities do you look or uh, do you want or look for in your protection dogs before upping their formal protection training? 
Uh, I look for resilience. I look for their ability to adapt to different environments. Uh, grips are always, you know, first and foremost, the most important thing for me. But I want to see how a dog uh, just basically understands, like, its work everywhere and is not necessarily, like, in affected by the environment that they're in, whether it's slick floors, uh, floors whether it's, you know, turf, whether it's in the freaking mountains, whatever it is, I want that dog to operate every single place it possibly can, okay, even as a puppy. from Life of Axel and Knox, when do you know your dog is done or proofed? Uh, no dog is ever proofed, in my opinion. Uh, I know people will say this, but uh, just like perfection is impossible, uh, proofing is not there, because proofing to me is perfection, and you know, it's the same way, you know, it's, yeah, I know my dog will bite something, but you never know your dog will bite something until they're put in that scenario um, and put into that realm. So you, all you can do is prepare, but training is continuous. Uh, I see this in a lot of agencies um, that I've worked with in the past is that, you know, people think that just because the dog bites a sleeve or a suit or a hidden sleeve, the dog is there and there's no need for maintenance training. And like, in my opinion, that's not, that's not true. That's not even remotely close to it. It's you know, just like we train, we work out, we do the things we do consistently on a daily basis every single day. Same thing with the dog. And, and you know, for a dog to be proof means the dog is perfected. And in my opinion, no, there's no, there is no perfect. Uh, you, can, okay. you can continue to um, work. Uh, Luna de la Sierra, how do you maneuver the tug to get them to bite oh. in? We've been rewarding by letting the dog win when she bites in or kind of push it back into her before letting go. Walk backwards, continuously walk backwards. Um, you know, have them keep pushing off their butts uh, as best as you can. And again, very generic answer, but you know, just keep pushing back or, or walking backwards. Don't shove the tug into their mouth because they're going to anticipate that you want them to create the movement so you're going to you're going to okay. consistently want to um, walk back and how do you get the dog to out how do you start them and yeah so i either use two tug uh, where i have a tug secondary i'll give the command or you know i'll give the command and then the dog will out and get wait hold on one second mike on another tug um no problem Okay. Sorry. How do you, okay. How do you get them to out? No problem. Um, I'd use a different, I, I use a variety of different techniques. Um, like our new puppy set, she's a giant asshole. Um, so, so she didn't want to out on anything. Um, and like with her, I had to basically hold the tug up, wait for her to kind of like, you know, I didn't, I didn't create any cray. I, it went, you know, pretty chill and I didn't want to cause any conflict either. Uh, and I just waited for it and I just told her loss, like, you know, very quietly. She finally let go and then boom, as soon as she outed, I gave her her, her tug and she's like, oh, she understood. Outing doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means like I out and I get my stuff in general. I get a play thing. And, you know, there's other ways where you can put a tug on the other side, like when the decoy is working the ball, just an, an ex, something outside, an indirect reward that you can utilize as well. Uh, I mean, there, and then, you know, you, some dogs, you have the hard out, break stick. I mean, there's so many varieties of teaching the dog out. Uh, I prefer a non-conflictive mm -hmm. way, but that's when how I do it. I watch a lot of these videos um, and I find them really fascinating. Can you kind of explain what's going on with the dog? You know, the person does a send away and then uh, bites on. Can you kind of walk me through what's happening? Well, a send? Like just yeah, a send? how do you do a good send? So we, all my sends are pretty much detrimental to my decoys because all I'm looking for on a send is my dog to cause as much uh, hit with as much pressure and pain as possible. So all my decoys, whether it's a frontal impact or a, a back impact, they're moving away. Uh, we're still utilizing prey to make sure the dog wants to come in. 
as hard as possible, but we're consistently moving back. So if I'm doing a frontal send, the arm is either here, dog's walking back, the handler, you know, cues the dog, or if we're, you know, introducing the dog to it, we utilize dragons in the beginning. Uh, I mean, there's just so many different levels of it. Um, but ideally, what I want to do, like what my goal is to, is when my dogs uh, are being sent, is that they're going to move with the fastest speed. They're going to hit you with the hardest pressure they possibly can, and they're going to bite and try to make you com make you comply as fast as possible, no matter if you're in a suit or if you're, you know, in real life. Um, but there's, you know, there's different levels with the the send as well too. I mean it's different than like what people see like on Instagram and like all this other stuff. Like it's not like all like the, you know, the stump bites and all that other, you know, bullshit stuff that like people put out here. It's, I mean, there's a lot of proper training that go into it. Um, and you know, and there's different levels of manipulation. Like we talked about earlier, you know, with drive manipulation, you know, making sure the dog understands like, Hey, this is a fight. Then going back into prey and then going back and forth and then running away and making sure you're catching the dog and make sure the dog has like, you know, they, the one they fly into you, they get a big win and like going from there, but it's, you're being the, you're being the good sparring partner. You know, you're, you're the person that can make a dog or break a dog as a decoy. Uh, and it's always important for that dog to always feel like the champion, you know, and it's, that's why I teach all my guys um, who work with me. Like you are the one that's preparing that dog for battle. You're never, you're not alpha dog. You're not doing that stuff. You're you're making that dog alpha dog. You're making that dog, you know, the strongest one in like mm -hmm. in the in the team essentially. Uh, does the choke off out um, cause conflict when dog redirects to handler? Uh, I've seen yeah. I mean, not all the time, but I've seen that uh, tons, 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 tons choking dogs off doing that stuff. Uh, breaker bar is what we typically use uh, for that stuff, especially when it comes to dogs who are actively going to, going to be, you know, you know, in, on the streets and everything like that. Breaker, but learning how to use a breaker bar uh, and manipulate the collar and everything like that is um, super important. Also, so in the videos when the dog bites onto the sleeve and it kind of goes through this, like, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I don't know anything about this, this, portion of it so um forgive my lack of knowledge uh like it seems like it, it's kind of well it's just de-escalating but it's just calming down like how does the decoy manipulate that and why is it so important to have a good decoy so i mean a, your decoy can make and break a dog i mean you can you see this a lot, you know, everyone watches the videos and see like, you know, these are, oh, I see it tons, you know, you get a lot of crappy decoys doing the work that they think they're doing right with um, for cheaper, you know, than pretty much everyone else. But I mean, a decoy can uh, greatly affect your dog by the way that they manipulate their body within the suit. You know, you get, um, and I don't know how much time we have to go on this <laughs> with this, but uh, if you have a decoy who works in a thin suit and just worse your dog who's never really been like on a suit or has no real get real no real grips you're going you're going to be rewarding negative behavior consistently because you're going to constantly be actively rewarding the dog by the way your muscle flexes by the way that you make your noise the way you bend your body the way you use opposition reflex uh you know finding proper weight of suits also extremely important body movements um, you know, using pain compliance, making sure the dog is being rewarded by like, you know, your muscle flexion again, like that's how we do things. And this is also a tip for everybody else who's a decoy, you know, the way your body moves and the way that your body works is going to, is going to mark specific behaviors. So for example, when I'm, I'm, when my dog is on my bite in the bicep forearm, like, you know, or last night when we worked a bunch of different bites, Every single time that dog counters, I reward him with some form of specific physical and verbal uh, behavior. And that's basically me going out or and my flex muscle flexing. I give them nothing else other than that so they understand the behavior, which is in, you know, kind of what you're asking as far as how's, how do you condition that? And it's basically me being like the clicker, right? Dogs on my bicep, they counter. I flex my arm out. That's their clicker handler says good boy reinforces behavior and it kind of goes from there and
you got to talk about like how do you build grips how do you build strong bites and there's i mean there's and using negative reinforcement i mean there's so many different things like with that i mean like the a decoy is a much is a very uh underrated thing and a very uh overpopulated uh, <laughs> uh thing for most um, people that being said and i know you could go on and on and on about this um where can people access uh, more information from you i know you have pc uh you online can you go through that yeah so um pcu online is a big thing all right go on there i uh, we have some of the top trainers in the world uh, nesbeth up in canada nino dewar in holland or belgium um we have andy kruger we have oscar mora myself is on there uh we, we have i mean shoot i don't even know who else we have on there uh, we have a bunch of different people on, on coming on to uh, PCU Online. Uh, and the cool thing about PCU Online is that it's something that if you purchase a course and you can watch it live when it happens, you can watch it all the time. And it's always something you can watch even things that are back in, you know, back when we first started. Also, all the K9 Street League things uh, are going to be on PCU Online. We figured out we have about 81 courses that are going to be launching with that considering the new scenarios and everything that we've been working with. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's so, there's so, so, so much stuff going on there. So PCU online, uh, there's the links are on there. Oh, at PCU online on Instagram. And then make sure you guys go and check out and fill out your forms. If you, uh, the contact forms and for uh, canine street league.com too, that just got launched today too. So lots of fun. And then chat and then Ray Allen in general, uh, we have a bunch of stuff that we're going to be working with them too. Um, I'm really excited for the street league stuff. It's exciting. So when is the first um, session in February? February 6th and 7th is going to be uh, another one of my decoy uh, seminars, but we're also going to be doing, uh, we're also going to be doing a street league certification for decoys. Uh, and it's important for everyone to understand that unlike every other sport, um, Canine Street League decoys, uh, the top tier finishers are all going to be paid. This is why it's a professional sport. So it's not like you're paying to go out there and do that. Decoys aren't going to go out there and, you know, just have to find an Airbnb or hotel and get, you know, get beat up and do all this other stuff. These guys are, everyone's going to be paid to be actually doing the sport. Uh, and the way that we meet with, without being compensated, uh, and for me, I, I know that all too well with having a six-year-old daughter and working my business and doing things like that. So I figured, I was like, let's, let's make something happen to where uh, these people who invest all this time and energy and money into you know, training, let's make them, let's make, let's make this professional and let's, uh, let's compensate these people and let's kind of unify, you know, the dog game a little bit. You know, that was the whole point of PCU. That's the whole point of Street League is to, you know, we're not dropped, we're not a, uh, saying one sport's better than the other, but we're just saying like, hey, like we, you know, let's make a living off of this and let's, mm -hmm. let's keep going. Awesome. Okay, I, let's, um, I wanna wrap this up. Um, we're, we're over the, the hour. Um, guys, Mike is, has, again, I, I said this in the beginning, has been doing this for decades and he has really, really made a name for himself in the industry and this is just, I think you said 20% of your business. The majority is just overall training. Um, lots of board and train um, clients. So I highly recommend following Mike and um, joining PCU, but really um, pushing uh, you guys to go check out his channel. I have learned so much, even watching your story. So keep it, uh, keep it coming because it's so helpful, whether you do protection sports or you don't. I appreciate you uh, having me on here. You know, definitely a fun conversation. And then again, guys, check us out, primalcan.com, PCU Online, Street League. I mean, we have so many different things happening, and that's just the beginning. So, so many things. But I appreciate you. Thank you Thank for, you for uh, your time. And uh, I, your time. I know that I will see you soon. <laughs> Perfect.
Yeah, Thanks I'll so be much, I'll be Mike. out there. Talk to you. <laughs>